Uh, my name is Pavan. I lead the product management team for AI and ML infrastructure. And Mona, you want to introduce? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Mona Atarian. I'm director of engineering. I run AI and ML infrastructure at Snowflake. Quick view of the agenda. We'll start with why you might want to consider migrating your pipelines to uh, Snowflake. We'll share some customer stories and present an overview of some of the capabilities that we've launched in the last few weeks and in the coming few weeks. And Mona will show a quick demo of our latest and greatest uh, capability on uh, data science agent. Um, so for those of you that use Snowflake for your data and analytics, which I'm hoping is most of you, um, if you are using ML, you probably are doing ML in this way, right? Where you're exporting data from Snowflake to an object store. You do feature engineering training and uh, run inference on a different uh, platform and bring back the results from that platform into Snowflake for unified view into analytics. Um, so this has a bunch of different problems because you're using multiple disparate tools. The processes are not streamlined. You have auditing, governance, access issues. Um, and with Snowflake ML, you can streamline your end-to-end -end pipelines um, and make them a lot more efficient, a lot more simpler to use, and simplify your security, operational, and governance practices. Beyond that, Snowflake ML is also um, significantly more scalable and cost-effective than many of the competitive platforms. Um, so the red one here is a managed service, uh, Spark service from our friends. And the blue one is a cloud, uh, a competing cloud platform um, uh, service on ML front. Uh, so we spend a lot of time doing this benchmark um, and ensuring that we give a fair shake to these other platforms. Uh, but of course, your mileage can vary. Uh, but we uh, think the reflect for your workloads, the uh, numbers could look very similar to this one, uh, primarily because we have optimized Snowflake ML to run on the best um, and uh, latest uh, uh, architecture uh, using uh, Ray-based uh, compute uh, platform, which I'm going to talk about a little, in a little bit. Um, beyond that, Snowflake ML is also very flexible. Um, you can bring any of your open source frameworks to um, Snowflake ML and run them without changing a line of code. Um, you can also bring your models, if you're training them elsewhere, and run them on Snowflake ML as well. Uh, we've built it in a very modular manner so that you can pick and choose which part of your ML workflow you, can, uh, you want to migrate into Snowflake. Uh, so this is a high-level overview of the capabilities. Um, so below is the infrastructure layer that I had talked about optimizing for ML, um, latest and greatest Python packages, libraries, uh, dependency management, all taken care of for you. Uh, in the middle layer, there are a whole bunch of tools, uh, which again we'll talk about in a little bit more uh, detail. And on the top layer, we have a set of interfaces uh, that are developer-facing notebooks that uh, Snowflake has, as well as external IDEs that you can potentially use, and also the data science agent that we are hoping will make data scientists and ML practitioners a lot more productive. So uh, who is using Snowflake ML? Um, so we have over 1,000 plus customers um, that have deployed ML pipelines on Snowflake and use it on a monthly basis. Uh, we have customers ranging from um, Ecolab in manufacturing to Zscaler in uh, cloud security to IGS Energy in the utility space. Uh, so customers all across uh, uh, many different verticals. Uh, so this is an example of Zscaler. Um, they migrated their ML pipelines from SageMaker to Snowflake ML. Um, and um, they had challenges in the legacy way of running ML both from a developer experience as well as um, administrative perspective. Uh, for example, on the developer experience side, they had to work with their IT team to build a container, register it, and it took them weeks uh, to get a model development environment going. And on the administrative side, uh, they had to manage um, access controls in multiple systems that made things a lot more complex. After migrating to Snowflake ML, they found significant simplification and rapid development uh, of their ML models, as you can see from the statistics. So with that, I'm going to switch to some of the new capabilities from the lens of um, an ML practitioner. These are essentially, at a very high level, the jobs to be done um, from development all the way to monitoring your machine learning models. Um, so from a development standpoint, we have three uh, key announcements. Uh, so the first one is our distributed ML APIs for PyTorch, XGBoost, and LightGBM are now generally available. Uh, if you want to scale your ML development, this is a very easy interface for you to do that. 
Um, and then the second one, uh, second announcement is um, if you want to track all the experiments and the iterations that you do from an ML development standpoint, we have a native ML experiment feature that is coming out soon that enables you to track metrics, parameters, and compare different runs and figure out which one you want to productionize. And the third one, uh, which we'll demo as well in a bit, is Data Science Agent. Uh, so this is aimed at improving the development, uh, and development velocity and productivity of data scientists. Um, so a data scientist job, as you know, typically involves a lot of data preparation, um, then normalizing the data for machine learning purposes, figuring out the right al algorithm to use, training, using hyperparameters to optimize, and figuring out which combination works the best. So these are all like highly uh, iterative processes. Um, with the data science agent, we are using an agentic approach to build you a baseline model, starting with build me a churn model, and here is my data set. And the agent breaks it down using reasoning approaches into multiple steps. First step is to prepare your data. The next step is to do feature engineering. Next step is to do training. And automatically figures out what is the right code to do that for you. And it builds on top of the previous code uh, generated for the previous step and gives you uh, a, a, a code that is validated and already run so that you can easily run it on uh, your notebook. And we'll demo that in a little bit. We're very excited about um, what it can do for data scientists and the productivity improvements it can uh, bring in the data science development. Um, the next step after developing a model in your development environment is refactoring your code potentially to run in a production environment. Um, and so this is typically done using decomposable tasks um, and uh, executing them using a task graph type of uh, a framework. Uh, so Snowflake now has an ML jobs API that enables you to do just that. Um, you can use any triggers or schedules and kick off retraining jobs with decomposable set of uh, uh, Python scripts and have them executed on your behalf um, and um, record the associated results um, in a Snowflake model registry, which is the third uh, step in your uh, ML development process. Um, model registry is your one-stop shop. Uh, to register your models, not just trained on Snowflake, but also trained externally. You can bring them into Snowflake and run inference closer to your data using uh, model registry. Uh, we are expanding the scope of model registry and uh, enabling you to run models with more than 500 features. Um, in, uh, it's available right now. And the fourth step is taking these models that you have registered and deploying them in a production-ready manner. Um, and so we have a couple of options for deploying models. One is our existing warehouse uh, runtime environment. The second one is uh, the, our Snowpark container services environment. Um, the second one is particularly suited uh, for inference for larger models, uh, if you want to use GPUs for inference, um, and if you want lower latency uh, for your inference uh, uh, workloads. Uh, we provide REST endpoints for the models running on uh, Snowpark container services to enable that. Um, and then um, in this area, very happy to announce we have a one-click model deployment from Hugging Face um, that is coming out soon. Uh, so you don't have to download models from Hugging Face and upload it into Snowflake to um, run them. Uh, this makes it very easy uh, to do through the UI. And the last announcement in this area is um, enhancements to our feature store. Um, feature store enables you to uh, define features, manage, discover in a unified manner um, so that you don't, you're not reinventing uh, feature computation logic in different teams in different ways. Uh, we are um, enabling lower latency access to feature serving through an online feature store functionality, and that is also coming out soon. You can retrieve features with 100 plus queries per second of throughput and uh, very low latency for your uh, real-time workloads. And lastly, uh, monitoring, of course, is a key piece of the model lifecycle management. Um, so Snowflake ML has capabilities to monitor your models, uh, to track a bunch of different metrics over a period of time, to look at anomalies, uh, to trigger alerts, and uh, um, initiate retraining jobs as you see fit. Um, with the explain function, you can also uh, retrieve Shapley values associated with uh, a bunch of different types of machine learning models that can explain the behavior of your uh, models uh, better. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mona to demo Data Science Agent. 
Thank you so much. All right, demo time. Okay. So we are going to look at a demo together. We are going to work on a business problem. Let's say we are a mortgage lending company, and we are developing models to help us decide whether we should approve a loan or not. Let's say we have already built a kind of a basic model to establish a base, and we have put that in production to just see how it works and you know, get some metrics out of it. What we are going to do together, we are going to look at that base model, we are going to iterate on that base model, get a better version of the model, and we are going to compare it to that base. Um, I'm going to show you how easy and quick it is to iterate on this and um, to look at the results in production. So let's do it. Uh, first, let's look at that base model. So we are uh, going to go to the AI and ML tab here, look at our models. Uh, this is model registry. This mortgage lending model at the bottom is the one that we are going to work on today together. So you can see in this model, we have one version right now down here. It's called Prod. This is our base. We have a monitor off of it. So if we click on this, if we go and pick maybe three months worth of data, so you can see this all comes out of the box for you, the precision recall, F1 score, you know, accuracy and all that. So you, can, you know now, like with your production data, this is the type of accuracy that you're getting. Not too bad, but this is our base model. We want to iterate on this and get this to be better. OK, we are going to go to notebooks and work on that together. So this is Snowflake Notebooks. It's running on container runtime. I've already have it up and running. I'm just going to go through the cells with you just to explain what these things are. So first cell, very simple, just getting a session. Let's just have that run. Second cell, also simple, just a bunch of uh, variable names. We are going to call our model a challenger model because it's challenging what we have in production. The name of the database, the schema, various things, super simple. Let's have that go. And this third one uh, just uh, deletes a bunch of artifacts that this demo creates. This is because I'm just running this demo over and over again. So just quickly running this to get rid of the things that I've created before. So now uh, we are going to use the data science agent that Pavan just talked about to iterate on this model. I'm going to show you how easy it is to get end-to-end -end working solution in just a minute with the data science agent. So let's go here, and this is the agent, very easy to access. I'm going to prompt it, and then I'm going to tell you what I prompted, and we are going to work through it. Let me just make this really big. OK. OK, let's go. So I'm asking it, give me a ML model. Let's use scikit-learn. Give me the end-to-end -end thing. I want to use this to basically approve or deny a loan. And at the end, give me all the model, like all the results, uh, the accuracy, and, and so on um, of the model that you just trained. So the data science agent basically um, takes steps one at a time, reasons through what it needs to do, writes the code, and executes it, and based on the results, decides the next step. Just like how a data scientist would do. First, it looks at the data. What data do we have available? What are the columns? What do we have that we're working with? Then it decides, OK, I need some features. And as I'm talking, it's just going through exactly all of that. What are some of the features? OK, we have some categorical features. We need to encode them. Um, some of the features have some issues. Maybe there are some missing values. We need to take care of that. OK, we have all of these features. What kind of a model can we uh, build with this? And then it just basically goes through all of these steps and um, gives us the whole end-to-end. -end. Right now, it has worked on understanding the data, understanding the features, and it's training a random forest uh, classifier basically for us, and done. So this is the results that it produced, and this is the entire code that it came up with. It is that easy to get to just the running thing end-to-end. -end. So let's, I'm just going to go back to here and run this. So let me just make this big again. Actually, let me close this. That's easier. So let's run this. We already know this runs because DSA, data science agent, runs every step. So we know it compiles and runs. And, and this is the result it's producing. Um, 
what I want to mention here, like this is still a simple model. I mean, for demo purposes, we didn't want to make it super complex. But it's so easy to iterate on this further. You can basically go back and say, um, what are some of the other things I can do? Maybe I can do more feature engineering. Maybe I can do hyperparam optimizations. Maybe I can do XGBoost, whatever. You can like, keep iterating on this very quickly. All right, so we have this up and running. So what we are going to do next, we are going to compare it with the base model that we had in production I showed you at the beginning. We are going to get an instance of the model registry. So that's super quick. Then we are going to log this model that we just built um, into model registry. So this model is, um, again, as let me just double check, it is called RF model with X train as the data. So we give it the model name, the model itself, a sample input, and this is now logged in model registry. Let's go check. Going back to this, this is the model. If we refresh, now you see a challenger model logged here. So what we're going to do next, we're going to run the same production data through this model so we can compare the results with the uh, base model that we had. So let's do that. Um, this is the code I'm going to show you real quick. This is really simple code that basically calls prediction on the model that we just built. What we need to do, though, we need to do the same feature engineering that DSA gave us. Um, this is live, so I need to just copy the code over. Uh, the same feature engineering we need to do um, to prepare the data to go in. Let's run this. And basically what it does calls predict uh, on the model that we just registered, registered, and then it puts the timestamp back in, combines it with the timestamp so that it kind of lines up all in production, and then writes the result into the table that we give it. Um, and then what we do next is that we basically create a monitor off of this table with the production data. So this is done. We're going to build the monitor, the challenger monitor, and then go back and take a look. So this is the code for a challenger monitor. We are giving it the source configuration. Basically, here is the um, table with all the results that we want to look at. Then we configure the monitor itself, and then we add it. And by the way, you don't need to write any of this code. You can just here ask Copilot, create a Snowflake model monitor for me. Use these variables. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can have all sorts of typos in there as well. Um, and just dump a whole bunch of variables, and it will figure out what is useful and what is not useful. Um, while this is working, let's take a look. So we already added our monitor. This is the challenger monitor we just added. We can go here again, what we looked at at the beginning of the demo, and we can basically now compare with our challenger model in yellow. You can see that with just one quick iteration, we were able to get a better model, and we can look at it and then go back and forth and potentially do more. Let's check the result of, you can see very quickly, we didn't even need to write any of this code very quickly. It just gave us all the code that we need to create the monitor. So you don't need to even learn how to create that. You can just ask in English and then copy the results over. So um, OK, perfect. That is it.